Welcome to Third Floor Views, a production of Chesapeake Family Life, where we talk about health, education, and living with kids. I'm your host, Janet Jefferson. Today, we're talking about Hole in the Wall Gang Camp, and joining us is Jimmy Canton, CEO of Hole in the Wall Gang Camp. Jimmy has had a long relationship with Hole in the Wall Gang Camp and since 1988. Um, and in that time, he served many roles, both as, as counselor and then also unit leader, assistant director. And then for the last 20 years, he's been the CEO. So thank you so much, Jimmy, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. To our viewers, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put those in the comments section and we'll get to those as we can. Um, let's just um get to it and talk about what is the hole in the wall gang camp um you guys are really unique in the work that you do so i'd love to just talk about that work and what it looks like thank you um uh when our our founder paul newman started the camp back in 1988 he wanted to dedicate it to provide a different kind of healing to seriously ill children and their family members uh, we provide that, those healing experiences on camp and off camp, serving about 20,000 children and family members uh, throughout the year. And all the services we provide are free of charge. That's incredible. I just want to highlight that again. All of the services you provide are free of charge. Um, that must be such a huge burden lifted from these families. Um, how, how do they feel when they're participating in your camp? What is sort of the, the reaction and the response from all of these families? Uh, joy and gratitude. Uh, you know, the uh, the letters that come in are very are consistently very moving and uh, that they I just received one today about a family that uh, that would never be able to experience this kind of retreat this this vacation uh, by you know they couldn't afford that so here they are as a family enjoying they camp together with their with their child who's sick and their other children. Uh, their child who's sick is getting all of their medical needs met at the camp with a team of nurses and doctors who can administer all their medicine so the family can just rest and enjoy one another and participate in activities that they would otherwise never be doing as a family. Mm -hmm. So is that typical that you would have the whole family there and involved? Um, or do you often have a mix or do you have some kids who are just there as as individuals and their families are, are at home or elsewhere? Yeah, the, the camp. Uh, historically, we, we started with camper independent programming. So we opened in 1988 as a summer only program serving just the children. We saw 288 children that that first year and uh, our summer program has expanded. So now we'll serve in a typical year about 1,200 children on site during the summer. And then we realized soon after those first years that behind every one of those children was a family in crisis. So whatever we could do to extend the healing, the, the healing benefit of camp to the family, to the parents and caregivers, to the healthy siblings would have an, a rippling healing effect on that that child with illness as well. So um, our off season, our fall and spring, not so, such an off season, but our fall and spring, we fill every weekend in fall and spring with family programming. And that's when we'll see about 25 families at a time. And so often what's really special about those family connections is not just the opportunity for the family to enjoy camp and really connect and, and relax and, and take in the joy and create beautiful memories. But family members connecting with other families mm. that have really walked their walk. Mm -hmm. So those, those friendships that emerge from, from their time at camp are, um, are, are deeply important and life-changing for them. Yeah, I can I can only imagine that that community is really strong and and they almost serve as much as a support system to each other as to yes. any sort of outsiders could provide. Absolutely. Um, 
So I want to um, go back to to the funding. So this because this is free. Um, how are you funded, and um, what what does that look like behind the scenes in terms of where the money's coming from and, and what it takes for you to achieve all of this? Thank you, thank you for asking that because it's an important question. Um, we will um, our, our budget this year is to operate the camp and the programs on site and off site, reaching those 20,000 children and families uh, plus will, it'll cost us about 12, 12 to $14 million in operating expenses. And we will raise that much money from about 20,000 gifts a year. Um, our founder, uh, we wouldn't be here without our founder, right? Our, our founder, Paul Newman and the continued engagement of Newman's own that, that has always been in our corner and will always be in our corner. And yet, uh, Paul never wanted the camp to be reliant on any one funding source, especially Newman's own. He didn't know what was going to happen with the company when he started it back in the early 80s. So from the beginning, from that very first year of camp, he charged the staff to raise our own operating costs. So today, um, Newman's own remains a, uh, one of our strongest supporters and their gift amounts to about one to two percent of what we need to raise a year. The remaining 12 plus million is coming from more than 20,000 gifts. So whether that's an individual who's contributing, a corporation, a foundation, a community event that's raising funds for us, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really inspiring community of people who step forward every year and allow us to keep to keep growing, to serve more. Yeah, that's, I think that's such an incredible story too, because it, um, it really highlights all the work that the organization does because there's, there's so much more than, than caring for these kids and these families. It's, this is a lot of money to raise to make this happen. Um, and so I think bringing awareness to that is important and to know that, you know, you, you guys are doing this yourselves and yes, you do have support. Um, but, but, you know, one to 2% is, is a really small amount. So that's, um, that's a lot of work fundraising. Yeah. And allow me to just clarify quickly, Janet, that all of Newman's own profits are being distributed to charities. We're just one of them. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, the, the more diverse our, our fundraising is the more the community steps up to make sure that we can keep operating, the more Newman's own can direct those profits to other charities that may not be as fortunate to have the community that we that we have. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so one of the or the main reason you're here today is to share some of your big exciting news. So um, yes. the Hole in the Wall Gang Camp is soon opening a new location on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, I'd love to learn more about that, more about the location, sort of how it came about, um, the relationships that happened to to make this come to fruition, um, the story behind it. So I'd love to hear about this new location. Awesome. It's in Queenstown on the beautiful Eastern shore and it is magnificent. The site is magnificent. It's breathtaking. Um, we know that the beauty of a site certainly contributes to the healing experience of, of our participants, of our campers and their families. Um, and this site as that in spades. You look to the east and the west and you have the Y River. You look to the north and the south and you have hundreds of acres um, that are set aside in conservation. So it's, it's stunning. Uh, four years ago, the camp, um, the, the camp has been growing our hospital outreach program, our family outreach program, in addition to our residential programming over the last 30 years. And about, you know, four years ago, we, we knew that all those programs were, were developing and we would continue to nurture those. But what was the next exciting adventure? Where, where was there a, a tremendous need that was being unmet? And for 30 years, we've been seeing children from the Mid-Atlantic in small numbers, from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, from Children's National, Johns Hopkins. Um, and it's a long trip up to Northeastern Connecticut. 
Uh, so we, we studied the area, we conducted a medical needs assessment and to determine if there, if there were children down there, if we, if we wanted to create a second residential location, are there enough children in need and are there any analogous services? And, and what we found out was that there's a real opportunity for us. Uh, so, um, so we decided several years ago, four years ago, I, about two and a half years ago, forgive me, that we were going to go. The, the findings suggested that, that there was a need. So let's step up to the plate and try to serve that need. We started to look at properties and, um, and this opportunity with the Aspen Institute came up and they had been gifted this magnificent property 40 years ago. And we're, we're, extricating themselves from the conference, from hosting conference conferences. And they had this magnificent site um, and they wanted to pay that forward. And so, boy, it, what, a, what a gift from the universe. So it, in essence, we are receiving 170 majestic acres on the Eastern shore of Maryland as a gift from the Aspen Institute. So it's extraordinary. We are going to renovate the existing site. Uh, hopefully it'll take about 12 months and we can begin serving families uh, this time next year. And then we have dreams for the full expression of a new campus. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we will recycle what we can reuse. And then in, with some of the rest of the property, um, pursue our, our dreams to create another extraordinary campus for these sick children. And you need a dedicated infirmary. You need a, you need a, a larger dining hall. You need a residential space where campers, when they're coming independently, are, are um, cared for correctly. So, um, and then program areas that are modified to meet the physical and emotional needs of the children that we're, that we're serving. So, there needs to be new construction. So we'll start that new construction. Uh, we will we will look hopefully for the for the community to get involved and and support that and help us uh, make this dream come true. And and the children we're going to be serving, uh, some of them are going to be similar to the children we serve up in Connecticut, children with cancer, children with sickle cell anemia, and then many more children that we don't serve. Uh, up in Connecticut that fit into the rare disease community. Hmm. Children who, are, who may suffer from a genetic or metabolic condition, uh, in, in, they're in very small numbers uh, where the illnesses are really incurable. There are very little therapies and, and these children live very, very isolated lives and, um, and their families um, live those challenges right along with them. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I want to learn a little bit more about, cause we're just starting to talk about it, but what is this second location in the mid Atlantic going to allow you to do? So you've talked about how, um, you know, you're going to serve a similar population in some ways, but then in other ways, it's going to be different from the Connecticut location. Um, and it sounds like being um, on the Eastern shore of Maryland does have you positioned to be near some really big hospitals that serve children specifically. Um, so that's setting you up for, for a, po a more positive experience for some of these families. Is there anything else that this location um, will allow you to do, or maybe that's different from the Connecticut location? Well, uh, it's a great question, but the interesting thing is we will start serving families. So the Connecticut camp started serving camper independent programs, and then we, we uh, really evolved into serving families. Hmm. This site is uniquely suited so that we, by uh, reusing the, the campus that's there, uh, that campus is specifically, does, will, will, will be much better to serve families than campers alone. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, so that's an exciting twist on it. And, um, and the other difference are the, the populations. Mm -hmm. So these trying to serve these ultra rare uh, conditions um, it, it will just be different for us. We're going to have to learn from the families 
how we can best care for the children. Uh, but it's what we've seen up in Connecticut when we've, we've started to serve the rare disease community up here in, in, um, limited, in limited programming. It's, it's, it's extraordinary the lifelines of support that are cast from family to family. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's really, really important. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. Um, so you opened in Connecticut or the, the Hole in the Wall Gang Camp opened in Connecticut about 35 years ago. Um, and you've discussed, you know, some of the kids that you serve up there. What what does the sort of a day in the life of a camper look like? What does the programming actually look like on location? It, it's your traditional camp you know um it's your boating and fishing your theater your arts and crafts and wood shop your horses your climbing tower um cooking programs cooking zones and everything has to be modified to meet the children where they are so our swimming pool is heated to 90 degrees all summer long Mm. (laughs) like even today in the mid 90s hot and humid up in connecticut that pool is 90 degrees because our children with sickle cell uh, need that in order to keep their uh, their sickle cell crises to a minimum. Mm-hmm. Any cold temperatures uh, kind of um, uh, invite a sickle cell crisis to happen. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that pool is heated. The, the special riding that we do for children who may not have enough physical strength to ride in a horse, the saddles, the sidewalkers, um, the... Um, uh, you know, all the programs are, are going to be modified. Uh, but the, I think the most important thing that we have at camp is our infirmary. So for typically 120 children that would come to us at a time or 24, 25 families, we'll have 12 to 15 nurses and four mm-hmm. to five full-time physicians administering oral chemotherapy, um, and transfusions, infusions. So children who would otherwise really not be able to get away uh, can still have their medical care taken care of and then just play. Uh, the other thing that I think is really is really important that uh, our founder always thought that by leveling the playing field, that was his goal, level the playing field, allow these kids who have been denied uh, just a normal, you know, really childhood experience, give them a chance to forget about their own for a little while right, and right. let them play hard. And as right. he said, raise a little hell, right? <laughs> and it worked so much better because he never anticipated, none of us ever anticipated the extra healing that would, would come along right alongside that safe play mm-hmm. when children would look out and see a hundred other children just like themselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that sense of that awareness that they're not alone And that there is a community that really understands them Mm -hmm. was the secret sauce. And that's what, with this beautiful exponential healing took place. In addition to just fun and joy, you had this this reverberating healing Mm. from that sense of normalcy and that I'm not alone. Yeah, yeah. How long um, are campers normally there? How what's what's the session length, or does it really depend? It, no, it, it usually during the summer it's about a seven day mm-hmm. session. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll have 120 children and almost 120 staff. Yeah, I can so, only imagine. It sounds like right? you really have a, a functioning hospital on site um, to meet everyone's needs, and I'm sure. Yeah. Th- that also makes everyone give them such a sense of peace of mind. I imagine um, because I'm yep. I can can only think that it could be so scary to to go out and try new things and um, and be able to relax a little bit without having that that in in many cases literal lifeline to medical care. Um, yep. So the fact that you provide that must give such a um, sense of ease for everyone. Absolutely. Our parents can, I mean, it's hard enough to let the children go. They wouldn't, I I can't imagine that they would without that confidence in their medical care. And on top of that, um, we just have these tremendous counselors. Uh, 60% of our summer counselors this year are former campers. Oh, wow. So like what better 
what better counselor to comfort you when you're homesick right. than a young adult who has been in that bed five yeah. years before, you know, yeah. it's, it's great. So it's a, it's a very joyful, magical place. Clearly it's powerful if people are, yeah. are coming. Do you have um, a lot of return campers? Is that something that you encourage? Are you trying to get as many different families giving them this, this opportunity as possible? About a third of our campers are new every year. So we hope to provide a camp experience to a child for three years. And if their health is strong and gotcha. stable after those three years, then we, they, we, we put them on a wait list. And so a third of our campers continue to come in new. But mm -hmm. if their health is unstable, then we'll just continue to serve them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the, and the very end of the summer, we serve um, a, uh, oh, we put on a wonderful summer session for just healthy siblings. Oh, that's really nice. So that's, yeah. So that they can go back and share a common experience and talk a common language with their, with their sick brother and sister. Absolutely. Um, so you do a lot more than just residential camp. There's also, um, outreach components, both family outreach and hospital outreach. What does that, um, programming look like throughout the Northeast admitted Atlantic? Um, what are the programs that you're offering and sort of who, who are they reaching? Sure. We realized uh, that when we filled up all the beds in all the best weather seasons, um, there were still thousands of children unable to get to camp that we couldn't serve. So why don't we bring camp to them? So we started to deploy the, this tremendous group of, of young people to be our counselors in hospitals. And so they bring camp activities right to a child's hospital bedside. Um, so today we have uh, about 35 to 40 year round employees whose only job is to do camp at a child's hospital bedside or in a hospital playroom four out of five days a week, every week of the year. Hmm. And we're in dozens of hospitals between Boston and we're now launching in Washington, DC. So we go all up and down the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic and into dozens of hospitals. And then um, after that program really evolved, we realized that some, some of our children were declining in health, were going home and, and really needed camps touch. So we created a, um, a family outreach program that would take camp to a child's home hmm. and invite the family, invite the friends to have several hours of a camp outing and do traditional camp activities in their home. Uh, or we'll do a pop-up camp in a local neighborhood. And we strategically invite families who may not know one another, who we know should know one another. Ah. And, and then we have a party for, you know, 30 to 40 campers and their, and their families. That's so fun. Um, and I could see you're in such a, a unique position to create those networks and connect people and build that community. Um, and, and I could see how that is such an important part of healing and, and growing and sort of learning from each other. So connecting families to other families, I, I can see being just a critical step in the process. Thanks. It is. Thank you, Janet. Um, Okay, so we've talked about this really exciting program and all the different aspects of it. Um, if families are interested in learning more um, about your programs or about participating, what's the process? Where, where do you recommend that people go um, to, if they have a kid that's really sick and they're like, oh, this sounds like it's for me, um, where do you direct them? Uh, I would go right to our website and you could learn about the illnesses that we're currently serving. You could get in touch with our medical team. Uh, if your child's illness doesn't fit in those categories that, uh, of uh, diseases that we're currently serving. Um, so it, that website is holeinthewallgang.org. So H-O-L-E in the wall gang.org. Yeah, that comes from Butch Cassie and the Sundance Kid. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, and and you can th that would be a wonderful portal for uh, thinking about volunteering, thinking about whether your child can come to camp. Uh, thinking about ways to support us and get involved uh, financially, that uh, I, I really recommend folks to go see our website. Hmm. Um, with that, with volunteering or supporting financially, um, 
you know, how do you recommend people get involved and what do you, what sort of skill set do you need to volunteer? How, um, you know, do you need to be a trained medical professional or um, are there other ways that you contribute as well? Um, what, what's sort of the, the gamut in terms of ways, ways to get involved? And there, there are lots of different opportunities to volunteer. No, you can volunteer um, in the hospitals for a couple hours. You could volunteer at a local event, a community event where we're bringing families together. That would also be a couple hours. You could volunteer on site eventually, and that would be maybe a couple days of a of a commitment, anywhere from maybe four to seven days of a of commitment. Uh, we, we provide the volunteer training. We'll see about 4,000 volunteers a year work directly with our campers and their families. And then another several thousand who support us behind the scenes with mailings and fundraising efforts, putting kits together. Um, so it's we have a tremendous family of volunteers and we will orient you and, and you are not expected to have medical knowledge. We have the medical team come in for that. Um, and then there are opportunities to support us. We have these wonderful community events. Someone may say, you know, I'd, I'd like to, to support you on, on a monthly basis. Some would say, I want to reach out to my friends and have, a, have some kind of party and direct the proceeds to you. Or I want to run a marathon and, and ask my friends to support me and I will have that support go to you. Um, so there, there are lots of different ways to, to get involved. Those are some really great suggestions of ways to raise money that, um, that are really fun and, and involve more community members than just, you know, sitting down and writing a check. Not that I'm saying sitting down and writing a check isn't important. It's incredibly important, but I love the creativity that you, you know, some of the ideas you suggested, and I could see how that could, you know, bring in even more people to help. Um, and I think often when people are thinking about donating and thinking about financial contributions, um, they're not thinking about different ways to actually do that. Um, so those are some really great fun, fun suggestions on how to give money and how to help out. Super. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Jimmy Canton, for speaking with us today. So Jimmy Canton is CEO of Hole in the Wall Gang Camp, um, and their most exciting news right now is the launch of the Eastern Shore location in Maryland, and that should be coming soon, probably in the next 12 months, right? That's what we're thinking. That's awesome. what we're hoping programming will start at that point. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thank you also to all of our viewers and listeners today. Make sure that you visit ChesapeakeFamily.com for local up-to-date information on home, health, and living for today's Maryland parent. This episode will be archived on ChesapeakeFamily.com in both video and podcast format. You can also look for links to Hole in the Wall Gang Camp there as well. I'm Janet Jefferson with Chesapeake Family Life and Third Floor Views. Thank you so much.